Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ. I've been going back over some scriptures that um, I we were going over on and grafted in Team Jesus a few, mm, I want to say a week or two ago. Yesterday, in the middle of the night, so it would have been the 23rd, to about 2 a.m. All right. The Lord must, I don't know, I woke up. I mean, just, just wide awake. And I don't normally do that. I used to when I would get messages. But I just woke right wide awake. And I kind of sat there waiting to hear if the Lord was going to give me a message. But all I heard was Ezekiel 9. Well, I got up and I read Ezekiel 9. And it was talking about God ordering the destruction of men and women and maids and servants and babies, children. And we had gone over that because they had been getting a lot of email about why, why would the Lord allow children to, you know, have to take the mark of the beast or, you know, you know what I'm saying. Um, oh, God, this is hard. Okay, so anyway, I went on and read all of nine then, and I was tired again, so I went back to bed and determined I'm going to read on in the day, you know, when I start reading my Bible. Because I've been really praying hard for the Lord to help me get more into the Bible. Okay, so I read chapter 10 and, and it didn't really, um, well, it showed how people got marked. And I, it goes on into the chariot with the wheels within the wheels. And, and that's really very interesting. But I wanted to go back and find out why these certain people had to be destroyed. So I was reading chapter 8. Now, I'm going to go there and I'm going to read this to you. And I want, want you to try to pay attention. This is more important, maybe. I want y'all's opinion on this, okay? Vision of abominations in Jerusalem. The Lord is going to show him why he's so angry. Remember the word I shared? It said God was wroth. Right now, he's wroth. All right. Ezekiel 8, 1. It came about in the sixth year, on the fifth day of the sixth month, as I was sitting in my house with the elders of Judah, sitting before me, that the hand of the Lord God fell on me there. Now, in the footnotes, it says, Y-H-W-H, -H, usually rendered Lord, or you could say Yahweh, uh, that the hand of the Lord Yahweh God fell on me there. Okay. Then I looked and behold, a likeness as the appearance of a man, but that footnote says literally fire. Now it goes on to explain, because I thought, fire? Was it a fire in the shape of a man? Okay, it goes on to say, A likeness as the appearance of a man, from his loins and downward, there was the appearance of fire. And from his loins upward, the appearance of brightness, like the appearance of glowing metal. I wondered, did all the other men, the elders, see it too? He stretched out the form of a hand and caught me 
by a lock of my head, and the spirit lifted me up between the earth and heaven and brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem. So he might have sensed, because you know that would have hurt. God doesn't hurt wouldn't physically hurt us so it must have been his vision started right there it went feeling like he was pulled up between heaven and the earth all right in the visions of God to Jerusalem to the entrance of the north gate footnote says the gate facing north facing north okay of the inner court where the seat of the idol of jealousy which provokes to jealousy was located so how did he that's a spirit you realize that that's a spirit that provokes people to be jealous of one another for whatever reason, a guy could be jealous because he's jealous of that guy because that guy has a more beautiful wife or that guy looks better so he's going to get a better wife, whatever. He's jealous because he's got a huge crop and lots of cattle and his farm only allows him to grow a little crop and a couple have a couple cattle. There's jealousy over all kinds of things. All right, but this is where the idol of jealousy, which provokes to jealousy, was located. So that's one thing that he's angry about. Okay, let me move this down. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel was there, like the appearance which I saw in the plain. And he said to me, Son of man, raise your eyes now toward the north. Now he's facing north, okay? They, or he's at the entrance of the court that faces north. And he says, raise your eyes toward the north. And behold, to the north of the altar gate was this idol of jealousy at the entrance he let him see it right there and he said to me son of man do you see what they are doing the great abominations which the house of israel are committing here so that i would be far from my sanctuary but yet you will see still greater abominations. Then he brought me to the entrance of the court. And when I looked, and behold, a hole in the wall, he said to me, Son of man, now dig through the wall. So I dug through the wall, and behold, an entrance. He said to me, go in and see. Now remember, he's in a vision. He's not really digging a hole in the temple. This is a vision that he's being shown. That if, if he were to dig a hole in the wall, this is what he'd see. Go in, the Lord is telling him, and see the wicked abominations that they are committing here. So I entered and looked, and behold, every form of creeping things. What creeps? Reptiles and bugs. And beasts and detestable things. Probably snakes. With all the idols of the house of Israel were carved on the wall all around. So there was a secret room in the temple where all this had been carved and the Lord was showing him. 
kind of reminds me of secret societies and what must go on with them. That's just my opinion. Standing in front of them were 70 elders of the house of Israel with Jaazaniah, the son of Shaphan, standing among them, each man with a censer in his hand and the fragrance of the cloud of incense rising. In case you don't know it, a censer is this device. Catholics still use them. Maybe other, I'm going to say cults. You screw it apart. You put your incense down in there. You light it with a lighter or maybe they use a candle. They have a lot of candles in Catholic churches. I'm sure they do in some other very closely related denominations. Anyway, they light their incense. They screw the lid back on so it won't come apart. And then it has this chain. It, it has a circle and a chain attached as best as my memory can remember it. And they swing it. They, when that, the priest walks through the church, he swings it, and the altar boys go before him and light the candles. One boy goes this way and lights these candles, and one boy goes this way and lights these candles. They're, they're in like the form of one's longer and then shorter and shorter and shorter. Or maybe the candle holder is made that way. Anyway, they I remember them forming a... A line like that. Anyway, the priest is walking up and he's swinging this incense. And I remember thinking, boy, that stuff stinks. It's a cloud. As you swing it, the air goes through the holes built into this thing. Shaped like a big egg, actually, with a stand on the bottom. But he's swinging it and swinging it and swinging it as he's walking down the aisle of the church. Or maybe it's coming in from the side. It's been a long time, y'all. I'm not sure. But he fills the place up with the smell of the incense before Mass. So anyway, back to this. This reminded me of that. Uh, he's saying, standing in front of them were 70 elders in the house of Israel with, let's see. Okay, remember he's in this room with detestable things carved on the walls. Standing in front of them, it had to be God and uh, um, Ezekiel. Standing in front of them were 70 elders in the house of Israel with Jaazaniah, the son of Shaphan, standing among them, each man with his censer in his hand and the fragrance of the cloud of incense rising. So they're worshiping. That is a form of worship. They're in there worshiping the creeping things, the, the wicked things carved all over the walls. Then he said to me, Son of man, do you see what the elders of the house of Israel are committing in the dark? Each man in the room of his carved images that made me wonder were, was there more than one room or was did each man have his own favorite idol in this room of carved images either way it doesn't matter there were 70 men in there putting out incense to their carved images for they say the Lord does not see us. The Lord has forsaken the land. All right. And he said to me, 
yet you will see still greater abominations which they are committing. Then he brought me to the entrance of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. And behold, women were sitting there weeping for Tammuz, another false god, women who were clearly uh, associating with the Gentile women, who passed down their rituals, beliefs, uh, love for Tammuz, and all that's about Easter. You can find all that searching about Easter. And he said to me, Do you see this, son of man? Yet you will see still greater abominations than these. He's showing them all the idols. Now, I'm just going to pause and say, okay, you might be thinking, okay, well, I don't do that. I don't be throwing sense, uh, sensors of incense to no wicked carved idols. I don't have anything to do with Tammuz. And you're fixing here of another one. But you realize the idols that Satan has put before us in this generation? Smart TVs, smartphones, tablets, uh, video games. Every year they come out with a new PlayStation and then, oh gosh, I don't even know. I lost count after I quit, you know, my third husband had three boys and by the time we divorced they were grown and out of, out of high school or you know one had moved to Ohio to live with his mother anyway uh, so I, I'm not up on all the games but I know there are so many games out there you might have one of the older ones and I don't know if they're still putting out games for them but I remember there used to be a lot of them some were not so expensive. Some were very expensive. And people would put out their money toward them. But would they put out a dollar or two to buy a cheeseburger for a homeless man? Anyway, idols. You can idolize your family. Anything you put before God is an idol. Just make it a simple definition Anything you put before God in your heart. Who is the lover of your soul? Your husband? Maybe it's your children. Maybe it's your home. Maybe it's your friends at church. Maybe it's your church. You could probably count them on, you know, your church, your pastor, your friends at church. Oh, then there's your garden club and your garden, your house, your husband, of course, your children, of course, and God. Where does he fit? Where does he fit? Is he first? Or is he last? Do you see? All right, I'll continue. Then he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house. And behold, at the entrance to the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about 25 men with their backs to the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east. And they were prostrating themselves. That means laying flat on the ground, which is the best way to worship the Lord. But they were prostrating themselves eastward toward the sun. They weren't inside prostrating themselves toward the Holy of Holies. Oh, no. They were in the outer court, the, in, on the, 
between the porch and the altar. So they were in the holies. At the entrance to the temple, between the porch and the altar, doesn't matter where, because I thought the altar was, no, the altar would have to be outside because that's where you would burn things. Yeah, couldn't be inside. And there they were, laying on their faces, worshiping the sun. 8.17 He said to me, Do you see this, son man? Is it too light a thing? For the house of Judah to commit the abominations which they have committed here? That they have filled the land with violence and provoked me repeatedly? For behold, now listen to this. They are putting the twig to their nose. I had to look that up. Twig could mean stick. It had, had a few other, um, what was the other one? A slip, which I recently learned was when you cut a, like a branch off of a vine. And if you pulled the leaves off, you'd have a, a stick off of a vine little more flexible they were putting the twig to their nose or nostrils does it remind you of anything why would the Lord mind them putting a twig to their nose This is what I want you all to help me figure out. Some of you said you wanted just Bible study. Well, I, I'm going to bring this up to the team. When Kathy and Dan are better, they're, they may be back tonight. After putting up that video I did last night and a similar one two weeks ago, I'm beginning to think, how do I word this? I'm just going to say it's not what they think it is. I believe it's electronics. I believe there's so many frequencies going through our minds, through our heads, through our bodies. It's possible. Now with this putting the twig to their nose, Um, I just watched a part of a video on BitChute. I'll put the link below. Just watch. I think 10 minutes is enough. And you may get the connection. You may not. You may think, nah, I don't think so. I'm just wondering, why would the Lord mind? Why is he provoked about them putting a twig to their nose? And then it goes on to say, Therefore, I indeed will deal in wrath. My eye will have no pity nor will I spare, and though they cry in my ears with a loud voice, yet I will not listen to them. 
and those who have taken what they have are crying out because of the side effects people on YouTube are asking for prayer for these people and I say to you no I will not pray for anybody who has taken something that has harmed them willfully you have to willfully except for the young people young young so now in verse 9 it goes into the vision of slaughter and then he cried out in my hearing with a loud voice saying draw near O executioners of the city each with his destroying weapon in his hand behold six men came from the direction of the upper gate which faces north each with his shattering weapon in his hand and among them was a certain man clothed in linen with a writing case a writing not riding as in riding a horse this is w-r-i-t-i-n-g case at his loins and they went in and stood beside the bronze altar then the glory of god of israel went up from the cherub on which it had been oh the glory of the god of israel went up that must mean like a cloud of brightness went up from the cherub on which it had been to the threshold of the temple the footnote says house the threshold of the house it's the house of God and he called to the man clothed in linen at whose loins was the writing case now I got thinking is that Jesus or perhaps an angel might be more likely but there have been cases it's called Christophany when Jesus appeared in the Old Testament when the writers believed it was Jesus I'll move on the Lord said to him go through the midst of the city even through the midst of Jerusalem and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and groan over all the abominations which are being committed in its midst they're sick of it they see the evil and they're sick of it and they sigh and they groan does that sound like you or are you more like it's not my problem I don't do that I just keep to myself or do you pray over it well we can pray that folks will remain unharmed by what's going on and that they will come to know Jesus as their Savior before it's too late but to the others he said in my hearing go through the city after him and strike do not let your eye have pity and do not spare utterly slay old men young men maidens little children and women but do not touch any man on whom is the mark and you shall start from my sanctuary so they started with the elders who were before the temple the judgment began in the house of God he said to them 
defile the temple and fill the courts with the slain. Go out. Thus they went out and struck down the people in the city. As they were striking the people, and I alone was left, I fell on my face and cried out, saying, Alas, Lord God, are you destroying the whole remnant of Israel by pouring out your wrath on Jerusalem? Then he said to me, The iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is very, very great. And the land is filled with blood, and the city is full of perversion. For they say, the Lord has forsaken the land, but the Lord and the Lord does not see. How could anybody believe God wouldn't see him? But as for me, my eyes will have no pity, nor will I spare, but I will bring their conduct upon their heads. Then behold, the man clothed in linen, at whose loins was the writing case, reported, saying, I have done just as you have commanded me. So, if the parents of these little children that got slaughtered were doing things and having them involved, I mean, we don't know where the Nephilim fall into all that. It doesn't say. It might in an earlier chapter, it might in a later chapter, but right here it does not say why the children. I say they had tainted blood somehow, somehow the abominations being done were far worse than what the Bible tells us. Please leave your comments and let me know what you think. I plead the blood of Jesus over this video and the content in it. I pray that it helps people to understand the Nephilim still walk the earth. And children are still being created by their being with women. And the children of them could be women and sleep with a normal man and they'd still have a child with Nephilim blood. And what about the children of Satanists? You say, well, they're innocent. They, they talk, the Bible talks about the curses the curses that fall upon the parents will go down to the fourth and even the fifth generation. Those children are cursed by what their parents do. And that's sad. And I pray that they just die and, and go to sleep. And then when they get resurrected and thrown in the lake of fire, they just die. Because I know our God is fair. So we can't sit around dwelling on that. Do not dwell on that. Dwell on the goodness and the mercy that he has provided by sending Jesus to die on the cross. He didn't have to do that. He could have let him come on down, fully grown, in a nice garb, whatever, garment, a nice robe, so that he looked like royalty, and walked around talking about heaven, 
and how you can be there too, doing his miracles, and then poof, went back to heaven. He could have done that. And those who chose to believe would believe, and those who chose to not believe wouldn't. Even if they saw him coming and saw him going and saw the miracles and heard the stories of what was in heaven, he could have done it that way. He chose to come as an infant and live a human life to be tempted as we were and are and saying no, no. No, I will not do that every time. The perfect spotless lamb went to the cross for you and for me. Does he have the right? Does father who sent his only begotten son have the right to take the lives of the ones who totally said no to that. No, I don't want that. I don't want those rules. I want to do what I want to do. Well, I hate it for the children. I hate it that the Nephilim children had to drown when it flooded in Noah's day. All their babies were Nephilim babies, or at least part Nephilim. Do you get what I'm saying? Even if they were just part, a tiny part. Okay, I'm shutting up here. I plead the blood of Jesus over each and every one of us, our devices, and our internet connections. I pray you all stay well and don't spend too much time on the internet. And try to remember to turn off your Wi-Fi's when you're not using them. Turn your cell phone off now and then. And don't talk on it up to your ear unless you absolutely have to. Cut back on all your electronics. We won't be here much longer, but let's stay as well as we can be while we're here. Okay? All right. With that, I'll say bye for now. I'll talk to you later.